welcome Lars Dugård from Copenhagen in Denmark to White TV. Uh, we are very happy that you are here and that we may listen to what they have done to you. And as far as we have heard, you are the first one in Denmark who uh, is dragged into this. And um, this was quite recently as uh, far as I can understand. Yes. Um, for me, it started, or I became aware of it in the beginning of 2009. Yes. So, yes. so yeah, um, actually, it started with a job application, or just after I sent a job application for the Danish military intelligence community okay. as a signals analyst. What, is, what are they called in Denmark? The uh, Danish military? Force if the right things change, or FE. And they do signals intelligence like NSA or military, yes. military mm -hmm. styles. Or yes. And they were actually looking for civilian uh, technicians, electronics people. And you are an electronic yeah. people? Yeah. Well, so I have the background at least. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and I can't tell, say for sure if it's related to that application, but it seems like very strange coincidence. Uh -huh. Um, I, I mailed, sent off my application in 2009, January, mm -hmm. and um, started to sense some surveillance, like just a sixth sense, and uh, just telling myself. You've got a hunch. Yes, a yeah, hunch, a hunch, and sort of like that. But you know, writing it off like, oh, it's just paranoia. Why would anyone have a look at you anyway? What's What's interesting about you? Yeah. So, for for some time, I just wrote it off and. Um, and when, the, when I was rejected with this job uh, application in February 2009, uh, it was like I didn't make anything of it. Like I, I was, had passed 40 years at the time, so I thought it might just be you know, my age or something like that. Okay, yeah. But the strange thing is that the surveillance or the hunch increased um, in the coming month to a very, sort of very gradually, but uh, I became very certain that I was under surveillance. And, uh, can you give some points of uh, what your thoughts was or, or what happened? Um, well, I, I thought my first point was just like probably this, uh, you know, counter-terrorism, whatever that's mm -hmm. when someone went overboard or whatever, I don't know, you know, they're getting too crazy about doing it. Did, did you see some people stalking you? Uh, not at that time, no, not at that time. But uh, I did get a very slight uh, sensation of um, hearing slander, sort of like people telling me stuff that at the moment I felt it was unrelated. It was like just an acute hearing, sort of making nothing of it, but in, in hindsight it's like, it seemed like a bit strange that the, my hearing would improve like that because I'm also a sound engineer. Mm -hmm. So I do care a lot about my ears. And mm -hmm. I, so so. Um, but I didn't make anything of it at the time, mm -hmm. uh, at, and also I didn't make anything of it at, that I had uh, what appeared to be a sting, uh, it was like like an insect bite, in right in the back of my neck, in, oh, in January January 2009. Um, in January, middle winter, winter in Denmark, an yes, insect bite. Yes, yes, it, it, it seemed like an insect bite of some sort, like a bee sting or something like that. Um, and Hello. I, what? At home? Yes, at home. Uh, just one night, uh, you know, when I woke up, I had a bite like that, and it's like, well, that's annoying, you know. But it felt didn't feel like much, but that. Where exactly were the spot? Yeah, that's the that's the strange thing. It was like a, it was pretty much looking like the Matrix, and that's why I remember it, because it was like felt stupid, you know, having a mark just there. <laughs> it was like a, it was just a most stupid just center of the <laughs> neck there. But the, the strange thing about it is that just um, is that usually this, it, it would heal within a week or something like that it was, mm -hmm. if it was an insect bite. But this one lasted for a month or more oh. before it was healing. So it's very difficult to heal. Mm -hmm. And that's why I remember it, because I had mm -hmm. this for so long. I didn't really think about it at the time or make anything of it at the time. But mm -hmm. in hindsight, again, it's like strange coincidence. And you have not been to a hospital no, or something no, like that? No, not for 20 years mm -hmm. at that time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. so that was, uh, yeah, quite strange. Are there still uh, marks visible from that point? Um, 
not not physical here, but I had some MRI scans done where you can see there are there are some there is something at that point, uh, but where it's natural. Or I can't say I'm not um, a layman, so I can't say if it's mm. what it is or what. Yeah, and what happened next? Um, after that, you know, I got very annoyed, sort of like during March and April, uh, with the surveillance that became very clear, and I can actually hear people from on the. Uh, starting to interact with my doing when I moved around my apartment and stuff like that. They here were here to... in another room? Or? No, no, in an apartment upstairs. I can actually feel they were tracking me when I was moving around, sort of like, or interacting on my. When I was doing something, there was something going on just to, to counter that or to follow that or whatever. And that got very sort of like annoying. To, again, I thought just might be the police, or they're check, just checking out. Like, so let them check out. But it's it gets uh, increasingly annoying. Annoying. So um, at one point, sort of, I thought, oh, this has to stop somehow. So uh, I started sort of like playing with them, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I started on the internet just downloading all kinds of shit and stuff like that to probe them, have analyze this like giving a finger or something like that. So we check this one out, check this one out, and so on. <laughs> um, and that's, I thought it was funny at the, that time, but it turned out to be a really bad idea because it got to haunt me a really bad time, big time afterwards. Uh -huh. That's why I want to mention it now. Yeah. Um, and then it increased further, and then I just disconnected entirely the internet in April and just stayed off uh, the internet for yeah, for the rest of the part of, of my time in Copenhagen. Uh, by free will, because... Yes, I just unplugged, unplugged it. Yeah. And then I started playing some computer games and you know, doing stuff that I hadn't gotten around to, encrypting my, my, my hard disks and stuff like that. Um, and then I saw basically it was a couple of boring months, like uh, April, uh, May, and just, you know, playing games, you know, have to... 2009? Yes, 2009 still. And the last couple of days of May and the beginning of June, it uh, all escalated. Because I became, during May, I became very increasingly aware that mind uh, manipulation was taking place. I could actually feel when I was moving, when I was in a fixed still position, that they were manipulating my thoughts. Uh, very subtle, but I had a very, I could very intensely feel this was not my thoughts, they were put on me in some sort. And then when I moved, just slightly moving my head like that, it disappeared and then it's like they had to track me again and then it locked on and I, I started. Uh, at the beginning the notion was very weak but uh, when I became more and more aware of it I could actually feel them lock on. So uh, a game of cat and mouse developed out of it. For, in uh, your apartment? In my apartment. Um, and it developed into sort of like a cat and mouse game where I tried to avoid it all the time and they had to sort of track me Could again. Could you give an example of what kind of thoughts? Uh, it's just like direction, directing my thoughts towards other things. Mm -hmm. It's just like, you know, you're doing something, playing games or sitting on the veil and all of a sudden, you know, they try to force your thoughts in another direction. That you focus on yes. something? Yes, I yes. said focus on something and something all of a sudden they, they try to force you off, off that. Uh -huh. And that's like a very unnormal, you know, so that's why I sort of like, well, that was strange. How, why, why does this all of a sudden appear? And, the, you know, usually you wouldn't make much of that if it wasn't for that tracking part. That when I moved, you know, all of a sudden, you know, just moved by moving on my head, I was getting out of the beam or the interaction. And then they, it's like they had needed like a 10 seconds, 20 seconds to sort of lock on, and then they were forcing the thoughts again in the same direction they wanted them to go. Did you feel a difference in the temperature as well? No, no. Uh, not at all. But um, I, I sort of like, um, beginning it was like very, you know, what, what is going on, and it sounds like incredible and uh, can't be. So uh, I played sort of like for several days where I just moved around basically to Make sure, absolutely sure, that, that that was this was the case that we were actually locking onto my force, directing them and stuff.
Did you talk to anybody about no, it? No, no, no. I kept my, my mouth shut and went into there. But then things got uh, out of hand in a few day, in the couple of a few days. Uh, when I was absolutely sure, I was horrified. You know, all I have ever heard of was, was a bit of this MK Ultra program from the 50s and 60s, and CIA Man the Man States. Manchurian Candidate, and mm -hmm. you know, guess, thinking, what were they up to? What, what, what were their intentions? With me, where I'm going to be a patsy for some terror, you know, in, you know false flag operation? Uh, are they going to create a Manchurian Candidate, whatever? So I got very scared. Um, enormously scared and mm. yeah, uh, panicked, so I just had to get out of this uh, area and move around. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I did that, you know, and didn't sleep and move around all the time, they, um, another system was activated. It's called synthetic, synthetic telepathy, it's called, or people refer to it as that, mm -hmm. where they actually can communicate with the wife boards. And uh, this turned out to be now it's now so I was on a death list, uh, list or something like that, and they were going to kill me because I had found out about this many. Did provisions. they say so yeah, in the yeah, thoughts? Yeah, yeah, I was now uh, officially on the death list. Was then, it the Danish language? Yes, it started out Danish language. What yeah. kind of accent? Um, in the beginning, it was uh, like 50-50 young people uh, in the 30s, both uh, girls and boys. Mm -hmm. uh, and just yeah, no no special thing about it. it was like uh, just common people, young people. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you know, you get more and more scared, <laughs> of course. So I had to avoid it, and I thought, you know, what can I do? So if they want to kill me, I thought, um, well, yeah, I don't want to be killed. So the best thing I could come up with was. Um, you know, moving around, just staying with, uh, around people all the time. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. I sort of started walking around Copenhagen all the time and always staying with other people in the hope that it wouldn't kill me in full public. <laughs> yeah. And then I actually had spent three or four days on that, basically sleep without sleep. But you didn't tell anybody, you didn't no. contact the no. police? No, not at, yeah, I'm coming to that, but not at that point. Yeah. So obviously you have been successful in hiding and not getting killed? Um, yes, but uh, at the time it was very credible, or it was made very credible by. We don't have death penalty in Denmark, but they have, like, they kept saying it was like a, a special cases and things just have, can't get out, so they had a special permit to, to kill me. Horrible. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's all about. I believed it at the time and I was horrified. Did you yeah. answer them and say go to hell? Yeah, yeah, uh, not not at that time, but uh, you know, I was f first baffled. Yes. What 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 was what was what's going on? Yes. And taking it serious, you know, of not course. taking it serious would, would be stupid. Of course. So um, I just moved around and kept, stick to my plan of only staying in public places like cafes and only moving to the um, central area of Copenhagen, where I just walked around and from cafe to cafe. And then I started actually staying on usually long time at, at every place, like hanging out for hours at one cafe or at a bus stop every time I, I went, so hang, hanging around a bus stop. And then noticing, you know, where, as all connections had passed, there were some, still some people hanging around the same place we have missed all buses. Oh, interesting. <laughs> um, and like then I started developing, um, like trying whenever I had a hunch that someone physically was following me or it's someone's, uh, it's often referred to as gang stalking or stalking. But um, I had no idea of the name. But I was just thinking of the intelligence community and they were, uh, you know, having a look, at, looking after me. Or, so um, I started looking people in the eye uh, mm -hmm. whenever I had a hunch with this clear intent of you're busted. Of, and from the reaction of the person, you could actually tell if they were baffled or they were definitely into it, in it. I so had the <laughs> same ex experience when they chased me with the Estonian case. Yes. And I got a hunch that that's a guy spying on me. Yeah. I directly 
with look. the front of him in the eyes, mm -hmm. and you could see the yes, reaction. yes, and, and you can you can tell yes. you can tell if it's someone who's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, and then, of course, I knew there were people around me, and they were surveilling me physically as well. When you moved around in town, uh, did they follow you in the contact, or could you get rid of the contact? No, I could not get rid of the contact at all. Uh, but it's like the physical was like independent from the actually uh, from the audio part or yes. the synthetic telepathy part. Mm -hmm. um, so I just basically had to move around and staying, uh, but I'm still going to work and uh, to stay alive. Mm -hmm. But after three or four days, I had to give up. So I finally resorted to uh, booking a hotel one night. You know, so see if I can get to some sleep in a in a different place from, mm -hmm. from home. Yes. So I, I was trying to find a hotel and I was rejected everywhere you know, until finally I found a hotel. Rejected? Yes, they were booked or full or whatever. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, um, but finally I managed to find a place and uh, I got a room and got up and um, tried to get some sleep. Uh, but then uh, I got a hunch that now they're coming. And uh, I was scared to death, so I went out of the hotel room. I woke up and uh, got out of the hotel room and down uh, to, into a toilet uh, down the hall. And then I could actually hear them coming and unpacking plastic uh, for like 10 minutes, pa unpacking plastics and stuff like that, and dressing in plastic suits. And it was really scary. And could you just... verify that visually? And no, peeping? no, no visual contact at all. Mm -hmm. I just stayed very close and try almost not to breathe, <laughs> breathe for. And uh, all the time, uh, sometime they just like five minutes, they start packing again, and disappeared. And then I got out of the, the toilet room there, and quickly packed my stuff and got down to the cafe again, around people, you know. Obviously I couldn't get sleep there either. But I regard that as, as a physical uh, assassination attempt or an attempt for extraordinary rendition or something like that. But definitely a physical attempt on my life. Mm -hmm. And when I get the, got down to the cafe, I was uh, I just thought I'd hang around a bit, not to be who are those people. And then I noticed um, three Germans. Um, and the strange thing about them, they were like young people in the 30s, and the, they were talking German and, of course, they had no clue that I was half German, so I could not understand every word of the, what they were speaking about. And they were basically unbelievable when you know German or, and know how much accent, just like I have a lot of Danish accent in my English, Germans have enormously big accents to it, almost every foreign language that they speak. That's right, yes. um, but they were completely fluent in unbelievably many uh, languages, like Russian, French, Italian. Uh, Those Germans? Yeah, there were three people who were bragging towards each other with all the language skills. And completely fluent in all languages. No no accent at all. That's was it's very, strange, very, 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 very yes. striking to yeah. me for German. I agree, I'm <laughs> German as well. <laughs> um, I just noticed them and then in the back of the room I noticed just all of a sudden some uh, Latino looking guy came down all dressed in black with a big black duffel bag and stuff like that. And I thought, whoa, <laughs> that's a guy coming from upstairs now. So I decided it was time to leave and then I got out and yeah. pretend, pretext of buying some cigarettes just up on the other side and finally I got off. And now, now I, at that time I had definitely had enough. Um, and actually I forgot something. Before I I looked into the hotel. Um, I, I could feel I had to had have a night's sleep, or you know, I was just physically exhausted after three nights uh, without sleep. So um, I went to the uh, hospital, psychiatric hospital, and thought that, you know they have a like uh, where you can just check in, uh, express care, or whatever. And then I asked for a sleeping pill because I need, definitely needed one night's sleep. And they wouldn't hand me one, so I left again. And uh, then I booked into the hotel afterwards. 
But now I was, uh, when I was got getting out of the street of the cafe from the hotel again, then I thought now I have enough. So I took a cab and wanted the, the cab driver to drive me to the intelligence uh, service. Mm. And I wanted an explanation. What the heck is going on? Um, but uh, I got something mixed up at that point. You know, he wanted to drive me out to out of Copenhagen to some far place, and I was convinced the intelligence place was in a, diff in a certain place. Um, so I basically forced him to drive me to that. But it turned out intelligence community had moved, so he just put me out of the where there was only a police station at the at that time. So the taxi, the taxi driver was actually right. The intelligence service had moved. But then I get into the police station and basically was asking him if uh, he knew anything about me being s surveillance and uh, I haven't slept for days. And he was not, and he could not tell me anything. He was not, he couldn't access anything. And uh, even if he could, he would not, was not allowed to, to tell me anything. But he recommended that I would write uh, the chief of police in Denmark. Uh, he's very friendly, very nice police officer. So he made, uh, I th he think I should write the highest authority uh, to get an answer. And then I asked him if I could sleep at the police station, if they would lock me up for the night. But uh, he could, unfortunately, he couldn't do that either. I have to do something criminal to be locked up. <laughs> <laughs> So they didn't allow you to sleep at the police station? No, unfortunately not. But uh, that would have been nice because then I would feel safe and we would be able to get a nice sleep. Yes. Um, but he couldn't do it. It was not, not physically possible for him. Mm. So I had to leave again and uh, it wasn't like in the middle of the night. I had to work, work in the morning, uh, not too far from there. So I decided to go to my workplace and lock myself in. and just sleep there because I was, if I fell asleep, I wouldn't get up again uh, to, to work. Totally so, exhausted. Yeah, totally exhausted. So I just uh, laid down on the couch on the reception there, to, so at least someone would wake me up when, when it was time to work. <laughs> so, and um, when my, uh, and during that night, the period, uh, there was actually something very strange happening, also in the hotel, uh, on the V2K. Uh, someone was using a synthetic voice. Usually I can't distinguish the voices uh, from ordinary voices, but one person had a synthetic voice, and most likely a foreigner, or I believe it's a US consultant or something like that. Perhaps a computer? And it, it's, it's, it's a translation system. You know, they, they have translation systems that basically just translate directly and produce synthetic uh, voice to answer. And um, this person was very interested in uh, two things. First, my knowledge of Tesla technology. Um, I have been following it. I'm, I'm, because I have this technical background, I'm a bit nerdish and I lo love to study technical stuff and like this. Yeah. So I've been following what was going on in the underground uh, regarding Tesla technology and the field of energy and stuff like that, because I believe that might be interesting to see what develops. Tesla, the great yeah, yeah. Asian researcher, yeah, yeah, yeah. making From, the electricity in New yeah. York in the end yeah. of, of the 19th yes, yes, century. Yes. Yeah. I, I think he was very, yeah, uh, it's just a very interesting field. Uh, he was before his time. Uh, yes, a lot of, many years. Mm -hmm. And they are actually, a lot of people are looking into his old things. He was mm -hmm. written off as a kook back then, but mm -hmm. uh, a lot of his theories uh, actually are valid. Uh, but I had not um, done experiments or done anything, inventions or discoveries uh, regarding his technology. I was, I was just uh, following what was going on yes. out of pure interest to uh, see where things are going. In. And the second thing they were very interested in was uh, an invention. I had invented a microphone that I was trying at the time to get part, find partners to, uh, you know, to get it started, either to make a prototype. And this was before 2009? Yes, yes. It was like the year and two years before I played with that and finally now it's time to build a prototype and uh, see if we can sell it off or manufacture it or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they were interested in that basically and um, that tells me that either this consultant was paid off 
by that mean that basically getting whatever information he could use for as, as maybe as a payment for his help or whatever. Um, that was basically in the hotel room. They was like completely drawing everything out of me. Of course, the Tesla there was nothing useful, but the microphone they got completely how it works. So all the all of the invention. Um, back so they milked your brain completely. Yes, I was in a very scared and you know mood and stuff like that. I was mm -hmm. a very easy victim uh, at that time. You know. Um, but now back at my working place, uh, the same synthetic voice was starting to talk a lot about aliens and they were making a lot of weird stories and it's all like uh, trying to hypnotize me, get me in a state of like mental destabilization and stuff like that. And now they were coming up with um, alien stories, uh, weaving them into to the context and mm -hmm. how they f advanced they were in technology based on their alien stuff. And that's why I actually believe that they were U.S. personnel, because I re consider the alien stories as a U U.S. myth, like basically like religion, but it's a U.S. the only religion or myth myth that the U.S. have invented themselves. So that's that's why I reason that they were. Mm. Um, and in the morning, there when my colleagues uh, arrived. Uh, they wake me up and they, I, actually I look like shit, so they could see immediately I was not fit for work. Yeah. So they sent me off to a, to my doctor and got me, you know, you have to stay, get reported sick or and stay stay off for, for a while till you're fit again. And, and that is a doctor who is used to you, who knows you? Uh, yes, I, um, uh, I was trying to get there to my doctor, who knows me. But unfortunately he wasn't there that day. A young woman was there instead, uh, and she was uh, completely, uh, I didn't like her at all. Then all of a sudden, out of the blue sky, she was asking me if I was hearing voices and stuff like that, and then it dawned on me, they are trying to get me committed to a mental hospital. But why else would she ask questions like that, out of nothing? Very strange. Yes, and then it dawned on me that she was intelligence uh, hired. And uh, that's why my own doctor wasn't there. So they were definitely trying to, if they can't kill me, they're trying to get me committed to a hospital where they can do anything. Because if you get committed, you're stripped completely of your human rights. And you are, in Denmark, you're also deprived of any chance of getting an aut autopsy if, it, if you die in the, their care. Oh, horrible. Yeah. So there's no chance it would ever get out. It would be a perfect murder for the, for the intelligence system. Um, so I realized that and I oh, got away from her very quickly and then uh, yeah, basically I went to, uh, then I went out what, what to do next so I went to, yeah, I went to see Amnesty International and uh, another uh, human rights organizations and telling them about him, I've been hunted, uh, they're trying to kill the intelligence community but uh, they couldn't do anything, they handed me a list of uh, lawyers. Mm -hmm. Uh, and yeah, I took that with me, and then I took a, managed finally to get on the train and get to my to another island where my family lives, and stayed with my mother for some some time there to get some recreation. What did your family in Odense say? Did you tell them anything? Uh, no, actually, I didn't say anything at all, um, because the story was so incredible and unbelievable that they wouldn't they wouldn't understand it. So I was just uh, reported sick and had my sleeping disorder mm -hmm. told him. And of course I had to get uh, my doctor to sign that I'm sick, so I had to call him from Odin, say from, mm -hmm. and get my real doctor. And he signed, just signed the, you know, that I had a sleeping door disorder and I had to see him within some few days. Did you give an explanation that, about that girl? Uh, so she was a uh, pra uh, practice becoming a doctor or something like that. Um, but then I went to see him. Oh, I'll just take it in, in the right order. Yeah. And then, but I didn't tell my family anything uh, for very obvious reasons because it was, the story was just you know so far out that I, I thought no one would believe it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so I just laid low and I had you know told them I was stress related and uh, I hadn't slept for days. And 
was taken very well off and uh, but uh, yeah, then I finally managed to get a night's sleep for the first that, that was good. That was a really a relief. It was two days. <laughs> <laughs> what? Did you slept two yeah, days? I slept, yeah, I slept a long time, yes. <laughs> Not two days, but uh, yeah. I got a good night's sleep, yes. Yeah. Uh, and in the following days, it, it really increased. They, they started to use very a lot of psychological things, like it's referred to as NLP. It's uh, hypnosis-based. They, they st started to really use that uh, voices to induce hypnosis and use uh, what is called NLP programming. And uh, just only to, also to, to get me to be able to manipulate me and get me in a translate state where they can tell me anything, I'll believe anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that was uh, horrible. That was like a month of torture. That started from that. Was it day. painful physically? No, that's actually one of the part things that sets me apart from a lot of people I've spoken to and uh, met. Not met physically, but also I'm basically the only one who has had no physical pain at all. Mm -hmm. So that that sets me apart a bit apart from right. from the rest. Um, but when when they started, they started to program. They they were trying to weave that story into uh, now now it's like now the death threats were called off and then they were death sentencing me again and it was like a big bureaucratic thing and two parties it's like it turned out to be like two parties that are fighting each other now and mm -hmm. some tried to get me released and the other party good cop bad cop were trying to kill me mm -hmm. and then then there was like that big bureaucratic fight does he have to be killed or not and it was like shifting like Five times a day I was sentenced to death, and then I was uh, pardoned again. <laughs> for Did you still believe in it? Yeah, uh, because I was in a trance-like state, I, I I did believe it, yes, at, at uh, that point. I had to, you know, I had no choice. Uh, but over time, of course, it became grotesque. Mm -hmm. And I realized, and also as I realized how much they were manipulating me. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, this became month of torture, with the, uh, where they, yeah, they they keep, you know, they're trying to basically create a monster, where they the use of anchors and you know, it's part of the NLP, and they can actually interact with what you see, what you do, other people's reactions to you, and NLP linguistic uh, uh, neuro-linguistic programming, Probably. I guess, but it's. Some places it's referred to as dark NLP when it's used in a dark spirit, or when they use it for, for bad, kind of, uh, mm -hmm. bad intents. Mm -hmm. And um, I tried to, I, f I found out actually that by just taking one finger or just one part and stiffen it completely and just, uh, then I could actually break the hypnosis. They were not able to hypnotize me in the same way as long as I had just here, but it kind of came like really painful. <laughs> uh, I had to sort of basically hurt myself all the time not to be susceptible to the hypnosis and stuff like that. And yeah, and then uh, they try to program you into you know everything you're not, basically make <coughs> monsters sexually program you into everything you're not, and that's where the part where. It haunted me, all the shit that I had uh, put on them with the internet connection. It all came back to me at that point. And it was really some awful shit. I, <laughs> I thought they should uh, analyze at that point, but I thought it was funny. Now it's not so funny anymore at all. No, of course. And, uh, yeah. That was terrible, and now it's like... Then it started uh, developing a scheme of smoke and mirrors that... Uh, where they tried to imply who was guilty, who was behind all this. And it basically moved around from everybody I ever known, uh, colleagues to family to friends, uh, and trying to put the blame on everybody I've ever known. Um, but I, I didn't react to it. And I, I believe that they are trying to either isolate you from your surroundings make you make false accusations about who's behind it um, and also to yes just to 
if you say anything about it or try to confront people with it, you'll make a fool of yourself. And it's all about, from that point on, about psychology, where they're trying to make you look mentally insane, uh, mentally disturbed, make a fool of you in any way they possible. And was it um, possible that they pinpointed all your acquaintances and, and, and people around yes. you by, by your usual research or was it uh, because they had access to your memory? They had access to my memory or not my... I don't know if they have access to my deeper memory but they can direct my thoughts and they, they can basically... it was like an interrogation that lasted for a month. 24-7 interrogation and you know um, at some point they tried to under the guise of a psychoanalyzing stuff, they basically started from my childhood and analyzed my entire life span. And they and asked it, you in your brain yes, yes, you yes, answered. Yes, it was an intelligent yes, response. Yes, because you're tricked into this that uh, now that it's the good guys, good cop, bad cop, now that it's good guys and you want to help them and uh, okay, what can we do for him? And uh, it was like psychoanalysis sort of stuff where they take your mind from childhood to present day. Mm -hmm. And the first time around, I was fooled. So basically, they know everybody I've been in contact with, and tried. Now they try to exploit that from one from one person to the next person uh, all the time. Mm -hmm. um, they later on tried the same thing again, uh, but now I was of course aware of it. That it was a trick, a trap. Uh, so so I didn't go into it second time, but they were still forcing it. They can force you. It's like interrogations with this directed force. Um, forced interrogation by directing your thoughts onto a subject or content. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as you, that you, you get, get to the point they want about subject or whatever they want to know something about, they can loop. It's, they use a feedback loop where they keep projecting the same so you, you're stuck in a loop about that until they are satisfied. They want to get all the answers. Your thoughts go off in all directions until they're satisfied that they know everything about that subject. And over time, I developed a system to break the system. And uh, this is, sounds strange, but it, it's actually possible to build a firewall to your brain. Yeah, why not? Yes. It's a biological <laughs> computer. Yes. So, so what, what I use this. A lot of the words they use, they are the first ones that come to your mind. So you just need one word that's unrelated to what they want to know anything about. And then focus hard on, on that word. So every time you feel that feedback loop, you can just focus on that word immediately. And Which is not connected to the, what they are uh, trying to, to look for. Okay. Just and as, as the loop goes on, you just focus more on that word. And they loop and they try to steer you back onto that uh, what they want to know and something about you focus about that word that is not related. It could be something like education, uh, colleagues, uh, anything. Not, nothing. It doesn't have to be any particular word. Just mm -hmm. unrelated to to the subject. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, that takes a lot of energy and a lot of focus to break it in the beginning. But it becomes over time. It becomes an automatic firewall. And it, now it's fully automatic in my case. So every time my brain, even before I sense it, go into a, goes into a feedback loop, a word comes up and it breaks it automatically. Always the same word? Yeah, no, 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 no. It's just a, a word that is used recently uh, in the V2 case. Usually it, it doesn't have to be, but that, that's what comes to mind. Interesting. Yes? Uh -huh. That's just the first one. You have to be quick, find any word, and uh, it's just basically the word that comes to mind is a word they use often. Uh, it's like everything they... So you can break it and you can program yourself this way to break it. So, so it breaks out. And now, now it's completely automatic. That's My brain senses by itself that they all... Good tip for other people yes, yes, yes. yeah, yes. to imitate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and this way you can avoid this kind of uh, interrogation. But it took me some months to learn it. <laughs> and before it became fully automatic. Because you have to entrain yourself. Yes. And they also use another way of like lie detection, truth detection, and it's basically by uploading pictures uh, of places you haven't seen, stuff you haven't seen, and you can't do anything about it. Even movies? 
not movies. If in my case, it's only still pictures. I, they can probably upload, I don't know what their capabilities are. But in my case, it's only still pictures, and it's all about how you react to them. But I had seen none of them, so I had no reaction. It's, it's, not, it's not as hurtful as the other te technique where you know they are trying to, to force your brain into it. Mm. But I haven't found a way to break the other, the other part yet. Then I gradually developed uh, to override this, uh, not just using the physical, uh, by stretching here so you can't be hypnotized, or trying to break the hypnotism, but also to override the V2K. I started to hear audiobooks a lot. Instead of reading books, just ordering audiobooks, and just basically having it meant, basically meant that I had a, I had a MP3 players on me all the time and was just listening to that 24/7 or even at night, just to override it and to uh, yeah. Uh, if I had to completely override it, I have to turn it up loud, and that's not a good then idea. Then you can't do sleep. What? Then you you don't have a good sleep. You it's so loud. Ah, uh, no 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 no. It, it's it's fine. You it, used to it. Yeah, I can use it. Yes. But, uh, and you can choose the context when you go to sleep, just have some positive thinking or whatever. <laughs> if you're into to whatever you want. Um, but it helps because it overrides it and it's... Uh, you yeah, just have to watch a little bit about the volume, not to hurt your ears. But with the MP3 player and having headphones on all the time, it's, it's tough for the ears. And that, I can tell you for, as a sound engineer. So, I, but I, I prefer having my ears destroyed uh, for the, instead of my brain, even if it's my profession. Um, yeah, that's that's something I would advise people to do. Mm -hmm. it, because it also it breaks the cycle. You know, you get some input that's different from what they want. Mm -hmm. So you get off and you get minimize their impact basically. And that helped me a lot. That helped me a lot. Good, congratulations. Yes. But uh, yeah, from then on, that's, I spent a month in this interrogation, torture sessions, and uh, that was basically the ho most horrible one month I've ever, and couldn't tell anybody about it. Yeah, that's also horrible. Mm -hmm. So, and eventually, as I was reported sick for several months, and uh, my doctor couldn't just writing. Uh, uh, sleep disorder on it. Uh, I had to go to an expert, so I had to go to a, a psychiatrist. Uh, but he recommended one for me. And I was uh, given the address and I was scared to death, of course, of having to meet a psychiatrist again death, because I knew what the intentions were. But it turned out he was a very nice man and uh, we had a chat about my life. Uh, I didn't tell him about it. and. Uh, Unfortunately, he couldn't find out where, why I had a sleep disorder, so that was then fine. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, and finally, then I decided I couldn't. I had to go back to Copenhagen to my apartment. Uh, but every time I got there, it got worse. Mm -hmm. They were definitely trying to force me out. And, and you hear in, in the other rooms. Uh, uh... Yeah, yeah. So so I. Uh, I was thinking, um, am I going back eventually to Copenhagen or what am I going to do? Then I decided to quit my apartment and then I had said the same thoughts and I found another apartment. And, but it, was, it really became worse every time I got to Copenhagen. They, they were, their sphere of influence on me was stronger there. Mm -hmm. So I finally decided not to, to move to, back to Copenhagen and I moved to another city. Um, and this, uh, yeah, that's where I live now, and uh, it hasn't stopped the system, but it's uh, it's different. Easier to cope. Yeah, with. it's easier to cope with. You had uh, some plans to move again. Yes, uh, then I, then I des finally decided to move to Aarhus, but I would like to sort of just tell about a few more things about what I discovered when I was living in Odense at my family's place for a yes. few months while I was reported sick. Uh, it was actually, I worked out their working schemes. Like when they had shifts, uh, crew shifts. And then I, I decided to minimize the impact they had on, on me. They were, they were having shifts at 7 o'clock in the morning. 
Um, and then I, I managed to get some sleep like from four or five o'clock in the morning to, and then I slept late just to get two crews to minimize the impact. <laughs> so that was just one of the strategies and it seemed to help uh, also mm -hmm. because they have to start over. So like I don't know what where the crew before had, had come to. Mm -hmm. So that was also something if if you can work out when they shift. Yes. Smart. Um, and of course that it all it's all about, you know, they're trying to get you to commit suicide. Uh, that different and that that's different definitely a pattern. Um, and it's the script where it appears when you read on the internet that basically most of the uh, TIs are going through the exact same script. Starts out with TIs, targeted uh, individuals, individual. yes, mm -hmm. victims of mind control, and mm -hmm. and and it all seems all to start out with um, uh, sleep deprivation uh, and through various uh, means. And but sleep deprivation is the first part of it. Then they try to confuse you, and they try to uh, gang stalk or stalk surveillance, make you aware of the surveillance, and put the blame on everyone in your surroundings. So it's all designed to make you fall, uh, to make you make false accusations against people, and uh, to make you look like a fool, and to undermine your credibility as, as a person. usual with those guys <laughs> false flag yes that's exactly and they, they try to completely undermine your 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 credibility mm. in anything you say so it's it's all about being aware of that and not saying anything so what i basically did for three months is i said nothing Good. i was very the silent man for three months Good. i was just nursed <laughs> by my family and uh, <laughs> they were of course worried that they have a silent man who was just basically sitting there, sitting in the garden, <laughs> watching. Um, and they, of course, became aware, uh, worried about it, but at the same time I didn't feel like it was a, would be a good idea to tell them. Uh, so, that's, that's, uh, it's better to say nothing than to make extreme reactions that mm -hmm. and false accusations and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm have to realize that what it aims at mm. and not to never to give in to what they want mm. uh, and also they, they they want seem to very much want to, to commit suicide that your situation is hopeless and the torture is going to continue forever uh, but then you you have to make up your mind as well so sort of like why should I commit suicide I, I might as well fight them to death and I made my, up my mind and so have others that I'm going to fight them until, until I die. Um, and that's, that's a decision you have to make at some point. Mm -hmm. And we have to do it actually by explaining the things, explaining the countermeasures uh, of what we can do, and to work together to expose them. And to make people aware of how many there are. There are thousands. Yes, or more. Yeah. Probably more. Some yeah. estimate thirty thousand. A lot of uh, guys mm. locked up in the psychiatric mm. uh, uh, clinics. Yes, that's uh, that's also the one of the goals because as as soon as you get locked up, the, you're deprived of every human right there is, mm -hmm. and uh, people, even if you die in, in systems like Denmark and stuff like that, that you can't even be auto, uh, get an autopsy even or a family can't. There's organizations forming in Denmark that want to have autopsies for their deceased uh, family members who have been in psychiatric care and stuff. And this, of course, all to hide uh, experimentation and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And that's it's horrible in itself. But uh, it's, but I, I I think very few people can will ever understand how horrible it is. So it's uh, it. You just have to explain it like this and then hope for that. But finally I decided to move uh, and I decided to move to a city called Aarhus because it was, I lived there before I moved to Copenhagen and it was the last place where I've had a good life before I went to Copenhagen and uh, so I decided to move up there to some friends and, and stay there. And that's where I live now. That's, mm -hmm. that's good. Did they try to stop you? To yes, yes, yes. They wanted me very much, very much. Uh, it was like... Uh, 
they were ambivalent. It was like this two good cop, bad cop situation again. One part of them wanted me absolutely, I had to go back to Copenhagen to be within their jurisdiction and stuff like that. And the other part, uh, I had no reaction to it, but they absolutely wanted me to go back. But at the same time, every time I did went back, it get worse. So it's like they were contradicting themselves, like they, okay, they fight me even harder when I get there, but at the same time they want me to go, go back, so I decided I'm not going back, finally. Um, and when I managed to get to us, it didn't stop at any point there, but it, uh, it was nice with the change. But actually the system, now they've moved very much into this NLP stuff and programming, and specifically now they concentrated a lot on the... They went a bit uh, away from the part with the interrogation parts. Now they basically had interrogated me from A to Z and they were not able to find anything illegal, criminal on me in my past, nothing they can use anymore against me. So that was the, one of the goals. They had to find something that would justify their treatment and they, they, they have found nothing. Mm -hmm. There is nothing to find. So. Um, now they concentrated on trying to make me look mentally ill or to get me committed. And then they developed a strategy of over a year where they... Um, where there was some month where I was just keeping on and trying to work out as I developed my countermeasures, how to react to it. And eventually they started focusing a lot of the uh, NLP programming. Um, where they put in flags or uh, and where you react to stuff, and then they, it culminated when they started to uh, program aggression, some spontaneous aggression, uh, to get me violent in some way, so they would get me be able to get me committed or something like that. But uh, it's also usual stuff, I think. Yes, yes, but they, they was really horrible, you know, all of a sudden you meet a staff, face a person and you get this extreme aggression oh. uh, built up and they want you absolutely to kill this person. Um, did, did they say it in no, the voices? No, 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 no. It's, it's, they, they can manipulate all your feelings, emotion, force. So it's, it's just like an instant, like a complete aggression, aggressive to an old friend, a child, whatever. And they want, want me to, wanted me to kill this person or child or whatever, whoever I was uh, mm. facing. And luckily I have a very sort of, I don't react impulsively to anything. That's lucky for me and especially for those I met. And also I'm very good self, -con as a, I can control my emotions. Yes. So I, I managed to stay clear of hurting anyone. Mm. But this then turned out to a major battle between the good cops and the bad cops um, and who, over the jurisdiction and eventually the good cops won this battle and uh, I guess it's because of this what it would be of collateral damage if innocent other peoples would have to die to get me committed. Um, and now the bad cops have completely disappeared, now it's only the good cops. But they are seem to be very restricted in their what they can do. So now it's basically just an information campaign there where they they have no clue what to do anymore. Mm -hmm. It goes on it is about like they have no clue where how this is going on. Just like I don't have no clue where, how it's going to continue. And you are not free yet. I'm not free yet. No, they're still uh, trying to control my mind, but it's not uh, the bad. Part of dark NLP programming has uh, does not uh, appear anymore. So, so they're not trying to mentally destroy me anymore. They're not trying to induce uh, violent aggressions and, and any sexual programming and stuff. That this has all stopped. Good. So, uh, so in, in a part, I'm partly free. <laughs> did, they, did they try to stop you to come up to Stockholm to white TV? No, no, not at all. They tried to. Um, to stop me sort of like half a year ago in, uh, when I uh, was going to Thailand in one of my vacation. They were very unhappy about that. And that's uh, actually shortly after they've stopped, the good guys had won. The bad guys came back in and started up the system up again because they didn't want me to go to Thailand, Cambodia and other places of Vietnam like that. How, how did they give you the information that they didn't like it? 
They, they were absolutely dead. They just say, frankly, uh, we cannot allow him to go there. And what do you answer? I don't answer. I stopped answering. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, there's communication between yeah. uh, those people. They're, they're fighting in the background. It's like a radio station you have on where they're, they're fighting in, internally over what to do and not to do. But, but you went to Thailand. I went to Thailand, but what they, I, I, when they turned the system on, I got pissed and the uh, first time I ever broke my story and sent a, a mail out to the Danish parliament, to the Danish police and Danish intelligence. When you came back Danish from press. Thailand? No, before I went. Before. Now it had to stop. I was really angry, so I just sent it out to all parliament members who were involved in law and military and uh, ethics mm -hmm. and, and anything that could be related. And also, and all parties, mm -hmm. and to the police, the local police, the chief of police, the intelligence community, um, and parts of the press. Um, and the stunning thing was that that's how I actually got a con into uh, contact with Magnus, who replied on my I said, well, my mail that I sent out. One, uh, which month was it? About? That was in November. The 20th or something, November of 2010. Yeah, 2010. Okay. Yes, and that they, it had actually stopped a few months prior, where it was only the good cops left, and then the bad cops came back, mm -hmm. so to speak. Uh, but I got absolutely no response. No response. No response. I got. No, uh, I, 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 yeah, I got uh, two responses out of like 20, 30 parliament members. Two responses. What and both, both, but both of them were out of office. Um, I got uh, one response from one human rights organization. Uh, unfortunately, they, they don't deal with individual cases. Which one was it? Uh, the, the Institute for Human Rights in, mm -hmm. in Denmark. But Amnesty didn't answer? No. no oh, answer. They are controlled by, by the, the New World Order mm -hmm. people, that's yes. for sure. Yes. I'm always, always and disappointed about that. Finally, both the human rights organization and the police, finally the chief of police answered. But they both answered uh, several months after I came back. It was like a month? Uh, yeah. It was well, like uh, February, February mid, late February. And this what, was 2011. What, what, what it was the uh, yep, yeah, yeah, from the human rights. Uh, organization, it was like they don't deal with intermediate cases, and from the chief of police, they had read it and they had taken note of it, but uh, didn't have, didn't want to do anything about it or could not do anything about it. So the only substantial answer was from Magnus. Yes. <laughs> so that's that's where basically where I am now, the, the situation. Very interesting, very interesting. But they, have, they are, there, there seems to be a lot of, um, you know, going on in the background and they don't really know what to do about it themselves. So it's, I think it's very close to having it break at some level. But they also, that's, that's the interesting thing, you know, there's been basically only smoke, smoke and mirrors and most of the information that comes through the system is smoke and mirrors and basically lies. Mm -hmm. But some of the information might be credible and I believe that the group that is now putting information out might be uh, more credible than other, the other. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of interesting uh, information at the moment. One of the informations is that the entire reaction force, whoever that may be, are involved and they all face uh, life imprisonment, mm -hmm. which is a bad situation. Second information is that the U.S. government will not allow a disclosure. Third information is that the, a, this, at some part is a doctor's degree has gone sour because of, of uh, I didn't want to participate in the, this <laughs> mm -hmm. research program. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's some of the, and the last, one of the last informations that I think is credible is that I can never hold a job again. This, they, that they have actually, I'm not allowed to work ever again, because I compromise everyone I'm, I'm around. They can they can see what I see. They can Did hear they what I see. They say so. They say so, and that's a major problem, mm -hmm. that I can never go back to work again. Then you have you start your own firm. Yes, I am. That's what I'm planning on doing. Mm -hmm. okay. But it, it's like if I can go into a company and work for them, they uh, whoever is listening in, 
and looking in, they have they can compromise everyone I talk to, everyone I interact with, the company I would might work for. And that's a really that's a violation as well. It's violations by after violations of the human rights and uh, everything. But that's this one is particularly to, uh, Article Twenty Three. Mm. But I think one should found and formulate a new article for the mind control mm. problem because uh, it, it is not really uh, dealt with in a good way mm. in, in, in the legal text. Yes. So of course it's a, at the moment it's like a charade, you know, I'm unemployed, I have to show up, uh, have to report that I'm fit for, for work and uh, I have to even go to job training courses and stuff like that. But if the if the information is correct that I cannot hold a job, it's like a big charade, big, big farce. <laughs> Another question: Suppose we are in court now. Hmm? Uh, what would you prefer to take as evidence for a judge for a court that cannot look into your brain and that is not so informed as I am about the stuff? What what I think is the most credible information. Yeah, but the best evidence, um, you are not making it up. Yes, the best evidence is that it appears to be that the majority of uh, victims have the exact same story. Mm -hmm. And that's very unlikely. Right. Uh, that's that's very, why very we are unlikely. collecting the witnesses now. Yes, yes. Exactly. yes. It's, and it, it's, it's, not, it's very on a minute level. Of course, it's tailored to your personality and your, your life. But it's like everything is in exactly the same order. And it's like the same steps that are going to harassment mm -hmm. and torture, actually. Some people call it harassment, but uh, actually I think it should be called torture. It is oh, torture. I agree totally, totally. Yes. yes. And that, that's, I believe, is, a, is the strongest evidence. Uh, and uh, in my eyes, evidence is also uh, that your family and uh, acquaintances mm -hmm. can confirm that you suddenly had a strange behavior, you yes. were silent. Yes, I, I just became the silent man. You silent. got a zombie because mm. you didn't go to sleep. Mm. And there was no other reason. This psychiatrist mm. could not give any a diagnosis because yeah. you didn't tell. Mm. And uh, uh, obviously there was something. Yeah, yeah well, well, things were getting better at the time, so I'll just, I was just reported sick for another month. Mm. So that's fine and then uh, when I moved I, I was fit for fight again so uh, mm. no and then it's a kind of credibility yeah. what, 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 what impression you, you give to, to the people yeah. you talk to yeah. mm. and it's all about credibility and they're trying to undermine it and try to make you look foolish yeah. uh, sick in some ways what, would like to add something more to the audience uh, people have to take it seriously and I would actually like a lot uh, to study it. There's a lot of information out, out there. Um, yes. No evidence, but there's a lot of research information out there. There's a lot of facts out there. There's a lot of testimonies out there. Associations, yes. groups, yes, yes. And also, I would like to have the press take this seriously. If some serious journalists uh, could take this seriously and bring it up nationwide. Somewhere that would be a great help. That would be very good. Yes. Yeah. As the New York Times did yeah. in the yeah. 70s. Yes. And also it, it's very important just to get uh, to know at least a little of it and know the places where you can find some information about it if it should ever happen to you or someone in your surroundings. Mm -hmm. So you can refer people. Because I spent the first half year or longer even the fir for the first half year I was completely demobilized. I, I couldn't do anything. I was not uh, I could not go onto the internet, I could not, nothing. Mm -hmm. So they completely demobilized me while mm -hmm. I was uh, sick. After that I was directed into, because of the background of my application, I was looking basically only into intelligence community and, and things like that, researching that part of it, the military uh, things, and it gave very little result. So, but in recent months I've looked a lot into neuroscience and research going on there, and DARPA research into neuroscience and the military aspects of that. And that has yielded a lot of results. So this is the place to look, not look up uh, intelligence, really, because they keep the things very tight. Have you any clues what uh, kind of intelligence agencies could be involved? Um, 
I would say NSA, uh, there's a lot of, uh, in, it's very different in the US. The, it's the only country that has full capabilities and ha where people are acknowledging that they are researching. They're acknowledging that they are researching into this and spending billions, billions on it. They're not uh, acknowledging that they actually use it, of course. But the, I would say the US is the only country that has the full capability with satellite. But a lot of NATO countries, and especially Denmark, a place like Denmark, Germany, and so on, they are very, they are close allies, and the intelligence communities are very knit, tightly knit group, much tighter than people believe. Yes. Um, and they have been privatized. In the U.S. alone, it's estimated that 80 percent of all intelligence work is privatized in the oh, U.S. Yeah. Yeah. And that this also gives a very big problem about how about those? Are they franchising some of this for research? This intelligence. Uh, tools, are they financing covert operations through this kind of research, uh, whether they use intelligence uh, money on that. Mm. Um, but there are different, the points to different, to get back to your answer, there's points to different intelligence uh, communities in the US. The military one would be the uh, US um, Air Force, because they control the satellites that are used, NRO and so on. NSA would be a candidate because they take National a lot of the security agency agencies. would be a candidate because they manage all this and the, the sort of like the, the part I look, filed my application to in Denmark, the Danish counterpart of that. And they of course have a very closely uh, ties with the UK-USA agreement, also more commonly known as the Echelon system. Mm -hmm. That Denmark is tied into that. Mm -hmm. um, and the torture and the psychological methods, although CIA has no actual big time uh, satellite capabilities or claim not to have it, all the uh, psychological aspects of it is, are clearly an indication of CIA. So it's CIA based at least. Mm -hmm. It's ba all based on CIA psychology, torture methods, and they have been devised since the Second World War, where they got it from the Germans. Mm -hmm. So it's... it's uh, yeah, and also uh, um, Auschwitz and uh, Dachau in particular, mm -hmm. where it all started. That's, that's the places, and it's very... The torture procedures are so obvious, CIA, but it, it, it points toward a broader that the intelligence communities are broader, uh, tightly knit than people believe in general. In my research, the Mossad shows up every time when mind mm -hmm. control is involved. Okay, uh, something that that is uh, in I've actually just discovered that uh, they're starting to spend billions on uh, neuro research in Israel, but it's it's only within recent years. So I don't know if uh, I I, ex I expect that that's the reason why they're spending billions on it now that they're going to use it for military and. Uh, intelligence purposes, they do very little else. Did you sign? But, but, but it seems to be still, I, I believe it's more US related than Mossad related uh, because they have started so late. Mm -hmm. did, did you uh, experience some ties to Mossad in your case? Um, the, there were woven stories about an old friendship I have, a friend, an Israeli friend, and stuff like that. It was woven into a sort of like fantasy history of smoke and mirrors at one point but no direct ties to Mossad like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were, Israel was mentioned, Germany was big time mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, it, one of the torture sessions were this interrogation sessions. It was a very big problem that I had recognized these three Germans. And it was also a very big problem that uh, I was very confident that it was intelligence. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's, they spent months on that issue. And that I was uh, yeah, threatening me and so on. That posed a big problem for me. Mm -hmm. If it was not, if, yeah, just smoke and mirror again. Yeah. So it's, it's, for me, it's like the US, German, and Danish intelligence rather than. Okay, interesting. Yes? Well, what I can. Well, thank you very yeah. much. Yes. As usual, I would like to ask the audience are you sure that you are not mind controlled? Goodbye.